Welcome to week four, optimization. And really it's optimization two. Uh, this week we're going to, oh, oh, and my name is Bill Foote. Um, and this is your decision modeling with spreadsheets course. There, got it all. Uh, behind me, you see all my uh, sub-optimized spacing of my uh, books and records and gosh, just about everything else. Oh my gosh, look at it all back there. Oh, 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 it gets worse. There we go, perspective. Um, and if you can peer very closely, way in the back, there is a dynamic optimization book. Wonderful read, very thick and not for the faint of, of mathematical heart. Uh, this week, we'll try to minimize some of that issue and maximize your learning from optimization. We're going to end up with a multi-period production model. But first, we're going to stop off and figure out one of the more difficult things that people have been trying to figure out. Uh, uh, what If you have... If you have uh, uh, a bull hide, um, uh, cut it into very thin strips, thongs, could be used for shoelaces, for example, or lace up your sandals. Uh, what, is, what is the area, the largest area that you can enclose with those strips. It turns out it, it's some function of a circle. It's the isoparametric problem. And um, you can get a very big circle of arc and a very large diameter, a semicircle, and that will be your largest. Very interesting problem. Uh, let me introduce you to uh, Queen Dido of, uh, of uh, Carthage. There we go, there she is in all her splendor, cutting up the bull hides. A famous um, a note from uh, Virgil wrote a book to uh, place Rome very squarely in the middle of classical history, known up to that time, which is quite a bit at that time, about maybe about. 3,000 years worth of classical history up to that time and the founding of Rome. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, Mathos Marion the Elder, Historische Chronica in Frankfurt am Main, 1630. Great, it's actually a very good woodcut engraving. Um, I go through the story and also give you some Virgil, not bad verse, uh, but it, it's all illustrating that our optimization problems, however mathematical we want to make them, come usually out of a very practical need. The very practical need we're going to uh, uh, first stop off at is um, the, the need I have every time I make a big salad. I'm, I'm a vegan. I eat salad continuously. The question is, how much salad prep should I produce for how many days? I eat a huge salad each day, about three, four pounds of salad a day. And it's pretty much all raw. So how do I do that? How do I figure that out? Well, it, it works out to two days. And we're going to call that an optimal or what have, people have called it an economic order quantity. It's a lot size. The amount of setup, where I can hold this stuff in the refrigerator, there's limited space there. Uh, there's also limited quality with cutting something up ahead of time. All of these things have to boil into my fevered imagination about a lot size. And it turns out that this has been thought about for many, many, many years. And, and actually in 1913, with uh, Ford, uh, we'll get back to Hamilton here, with, with um, Ford Harris. And uh, we're going we're gonna to follow his lead. This, let, let me show you his, his work. I can find it again. 
how many parts here's here's the article it's in your reading how many parts to make it once how many days of salad to make it once for Simone Tortier and uh, uh, Ms. Fozzi, her CFO, it's how many pies should we store? And there are good reasons to do this. First of all, demand fluctuates up and down. Uh, my economic order quantity for making pie has nothing to do with demand. Now, that's kind of part of it, but... Um, it has to do with how much time and how much space. Those are my scarce quantities. And we find that whatever those scarce quantities are, we work to uh, optimize our time. We, we don't want to spend all day long chopping because I'm not a chef, barely a cook, but I'm pretty good with a very sharp French knife. I know how to cut that properly, sawing through it. Um, uh, only a few scars. Uh, but my board that I can cut on is actually of only so much size. Plus, I got a cat, I got to feed, I got to bring stuff upstairs, downstairs to the laundry. You know, stuff happens. I got to teach a class, right? And all of these things are my Queen Dido's bullhide. A very practical problem, and I begin to think about it. And I read, I read stuff like like uh, Ford Harris, for example, uh, which kind of started all this. And, and this is what he gets to. He gets to a very simple set of curves. We're going to look at the same thing, a folding cost, setup cost or replenishment rate or order rate, and total cost at the top. If this looks like something out of your economics textbook, well, welcome. This is exactly what's out of the economics textbook. This is before the economics textbook came out that you probably read. Okay. And there's an equation involved. And the equation, uh, X is the number of units to be made or ordered or put on hand. And, and uh, S is the setup cost per unit. It's this S over X, which creates the beautiful <laughs> hyperbolic curve with an asymptote on the replenishment curve and another asymptote, yes, I'm talking math, on the holding cost. So we're going to get into that in a couple of minutes. We're not going to spend a lot of time with this, uh, but this is a good read. We can see different, different configurations give you different cost relationships. And it's things like this that have found their way into AI systems in controlling manufacturing. This is the minimal amount of information you need in order to control manufacturing under certain circumstances. And this system actually works quite well for a lot of situations, first order situations, second and third order, eh, a, little bit, a little bit different. So we get back to Queen Dido, and now we're gonna make some dough. Yeah, and some pie filling, and put it together into two different types of pies. Um, and those are the two outputs from the production of Make a Pie. Uh, Tortier and Fozzi want to start looking at their cost structure. They also want to look at how they could possibly expand their facilities. They know that inventory is a buffer, a safety stock, if you will, for movements in demand. Demand goes up, demand goes down. Do you have enough to meet the high demand? Are you investing too much in the low demand area? Okay, these are things that have to be understood. In a sense, inventory becomes a smoothing tool, a smoothing mechanism. And it's also intertemporal. What we have on hand today, produce some more, demand some more tomorrow, we have on hand tomorrow, and so on and so forth. There's an interperiod, intertemporal, inter time frame issue to be thought through. As always, we have decisions, criteria, and constraints to consider. The decision immediately is how much inventory 
on hand, should we hold? And uh, if you've done management accounting and ratio analysis and fi financial statement analysis, we try to get a handle on that from a macro perspective, the whole firm or whole enterprise or the whole department or whatever we're talking about with something called days on hand. How many days of inventory do we have on hand? And that locks into this, okay? but it's usually a higher order metric, higher order than what we're doing right here. So that, that's what that will be. And the criteria that will, uh, uh, criterion actually, but it's in a sense criteria because it's period to period to period. But the criterion we will use is in our particular case, because we're dealing with weeks, uh, at the moment we're dealing with undiscounted costs per uh, each week. And that's going to um, uh, add up three kinds of costs. We're going to immediately look at just two of those, storage costs and replenishment costs. Ford Harris calls replenishment costs setup cost. <laughs> when I make my salad, the setup is not trivial. I have to get vegetables from the refrigerator. I have to have them in the first place. And that's part of the setup. Sometimes I have to take a walk to the green store. These are effort. Uh, 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 jobs with effort. Um, I got to get the kitchen in a situation where I can do this. If there's dishes in the sink, they got to be cleared out because I got to wash vegetables in the sink. Set up costs. Okay. Uh, production costs or, or PO duction costs here. I'll fix that. Whew. E is right next to R on the keyboard. Please excuse my bad finger behavior here um, is the original procurement cost and it actually comes in when we figure out investment we'll see that in a couple of minutes as well storage cost everything from refrigeration to ensuring uh, that my salad is cold right <laughs> I pay a high con ed rate for that insurance by the way that the refrigerator is always on and some facilities as at the beginning of the Moodle uh, 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 site, for those of you who visit the Moodle site or can visit the Moodle site, is a great big walk-in uh, cold storage unit of varying temperatures. It looks like a warehouse because it is. It's refrigerated. And in some places, it's deep freeze. But it's a huge walk-in facility. And this is where I mean, you take something like Tyson or you know, Tyson's Banquet Pies, uh, and we're talking about pies here, uh, Mrs. Morton's, uh, you know, calendar or whatever. Uh, they're in boxes of a particular optimal size, by the way. That's another economic ordering quantity kind of a problem. And uh, they fit in particular places. You got to think about, about why cubic boxes are used. They're used because it's, it's a Euclid's, it's Euclid's theorem. Uh, it's the largest enclosed space for a particular size is a square and a cube. It's larger than the, than the basketball you can fit inside of it. And uh, if you're thinking container ships, you also begin to think of taking a cube and doubling it, and that's the length of the container. It, it, all of these things become rules of thumb, but have a very strong basis in an optimizing desire here to minimize costs, minimize uh, the, the effect of all sorts of issues, including storage space. Um, constraints. Uh, there are a lot of constraints already complicit in here. Complicit, yes, a lot of complicit stuff going on. Um, but there are two constraints we're gonna look at is the amount of inventory investment and the amount of space, just those two. Um, if I were uh, doing an analysis for uh, the insurance cover for inventory, I would add a few more constraints on it, some of them of a probabilistic nature, not too hard to put in, but something that actually can be optimized. Okay, leave that for the moment. Model me an EOQ. Okay, first, the first step is always to go in front of the client and just draw this out on 
whatever board is available is a whiteboard in this particular case, nice markers and so on. At the top is a minimized cost. It's my influence diagram. At the bottom is the order quantity. Order quantity affects the average inventory, which is the usual way we, we, we cheat a little bit here for holding costs. Take, take the beginning plus the end and divide by two. Get the average inventory. Uh, you can be a little bit more precise than that, but it tends to not matter very much, if at all. There are cases where it will. We have uh, uh, in the circles here, we have things that can vary. We can put little slide bars on each one of these, or we don't use a slide bar. We can model them with a probability distribution, which is what we're going to do next week. Uh, replenishment cost per order. How many are in the order is Q, the average order, holding costs of an average order. Purchase cost is going to be for funding. Purchase, holding, replenishment, the setup cost itself is going to be the demand rate. Demand divided by Q is going to give us how many times Q is demand setup cost and this is the setup cost uh, all of those feed to minimize cost we're going to find that this is not a great way to do things for two way two reasons one um, it only happens in a period in a period in a period and two it only takes into account the cost dimension of holding inventory notice we have demand here the whole point of having inventory is to uh, ensure ensure demand is met. So there's probably a profit motive here, and yeah, we can get to that. We might not get that to that even at the end of this week, but we can get to that. Okay, so I use a little bit of math here, QI for um, uh, product one and product two. And I give you uh, an example of you know how to compute these things. Uh, not not too bad uh, a problem, uh, but the number of orders, 50 orders or replenishments. That that's that's a neat thing to try to understand. If demand is up 11,000, and each uh, each time you order, you're going to order 200 things at a time. In this case, from the production department, it's not ordering from outside. It's ordering from the production department, but it could be ordering from outside if the production port department has contracted their manufacturing of pies somewhere else. Yeah, and that's where Torsia and Fazi are probably going to go. They might license. This is what Coca-Cola does with bottling. They have a strong... As, you get Coca-Cola from Coca-Cola? No, you get the syrup recipe, of course. It's super secret. Yeah. So here's the total cost. We'll call it CI, HI. There's a holding cost and a replenishment cost that might be different, might be the same, might be different for each product. Holding cost times the amount you're holding on average. Setup cost times the number of orders. So the setup cost is per order. And now there's a little calculus. Don't worry about the calculus. I put it here just to be complete. This is typically a very straightforward calculus problem. We see that cost is nonlinear in Q. Here's a, here's a straight line. What is this thing? Anything in a ratio like this is a hyper is hyperbolic. Okay. Hyperbole, exaggeration, yeah, as a figure of speech. Uh, in this case, it's going to be downward sloping. We'll see that shape in a moment. We take the derivative of both sides. Now, from an economic point of view, that's calculating the marginal holding cost and the marginal replenishment cost. Notice the replenishment cost skates along a little bit faster, that's Q squared, than Q. We set these equal together. 
we find the Q such that the marginal holding cost is exactly offset by the marginal replenishment cost. Solve for Q, we get the infamous square root law of economic order quantity. Now, uh, Merton Miller and a guy by the name of Orr, gosh, I can't remember, I think it's Robert, I can't remember his first name, Miller and Orr in the late 50s come up with a cash management model that works just like this. And I have used models like this to model broker dealer operations where we need to know the inventory of securities to be held. Only well, we put a little, a little probability into that one. Okay, exactly the same sets of ideas are guiding everything, but just look quickly. The order size, how many salads I make, how many pies do I order is inverse to the holding cost per unit, but is direct, directly proportional to um, the demand D and the replenishment cost. Okay, and that's something to think through. That's absolutely something to think through. Uh, here's an example. Up in the numbers, we get a result. The star means optimal and it's rough, roughly 145, whatever the units are. I, I, I drew a picture of this for you. Uh, by the way, all of these pictures are 100% in Excel. Okay. Uh, I did not use my favorite platform of the decade, which is of the decade. Oh, no, longer than that. R. Never like Python. Too many, too many, too many spaces to worry about. Costs on the vertical axis, lot size, order quantity, number of setups <laughs> is, is being measured on this orange curve. Look at how it goes down lazily over here, fast over here, and then it gets slower and slower and slower and then slower and slower. Look at where they cross. The simultaneous equation of those two will give us the correct lot size. This is directly the notion of there's slopes. One's a negative slope, one's a positive slope. The absolute value of their slopes is equal at this point. Equal. And that's the optimality principle here. Here's a total cost curve at these two coordinate at this coordinate. 193 by 145 cost. Uh, what's happening here is that the gain from increasing lot size begins to flatten out. There is no gain right there. That's a tangent line. No further gain to increasing lot size. Coming down the other way, no further gain to decreasing lot size. That is optimality. That is what optimality is. Use it, cherish it, it's very useful. Okay. And the rest of this just goes through those interesting um, sets of ideas. So uh, how do we actually implement this? Well, of course, we pop in data, uh, $2 setup for both uh, to replenish costs. How do you come up with that? Well, you do an activity-based costing analysis. You find bases on which to cost um, uh, the setup for uh, bringing new inventory in, retiring old inventory out to make space. Now, this could be cleaning. This could be administrative. This could be insurance. This could be inspections. This is food, remember, in New York City in this particular case. Uh, food inspectors are a very interesting group of people. Regulations change all the time. This is might be a legal opinion or two about the place. Uh, this might be um, um, ongoing leasehold improvement. You might be leasing the facility and you have to improve the facility in order to handle the food. Okay, set up. All right. Holding cost per unit is probably the energy needed to feed the refrigerators or the cost of a lease at a leasing facility, leased facility. Okay. 
That could be part of it. And that might be leased on shelf space availability. How many cubic feet of shelf space do you need, Mr. Foot? Okay. And demand is 7,000 pies for fruit and 4,000 for savory. And we had an idea about how to estimate that demand uh, next week and the week after. We're going to get into something a little bit more complicated than that, a little bit more interesting. And we hear, you see here the calculation. There's a uh, square root involved. We use solver here to minimize the total cost. Okay, I have it set at one and one here just to start it up, just to make sure my formulas work. I am changing cells C4 to CD, uh, to D4, I'm sorry. There are no constraints. I have to, you could try this with simplex, won't work. You'll, you'll get what is called a nonlinearity issue, and you'll get a re report, a nonlinearity report. But uh, here I use a nonlinear solver. And this is similar, uh, the same ilk, but much better uh, solver that we uh, might use with goal seek, for example, an optimization problem. We did brute force optimization with uh, make a pie before this, where we found by making a grid of prices and calculating the net present value or the weekly profit versus those prices, find, that was the index match, find the row with the highest net present value and at that row find the corresponding price. Oh, lots of optimization going on, okay? but that is optimization. And grid approximation is a great way to do things because you can use a little function called max, max NPV. <laughs> it's optimization, definitely. And I use it quite frequently, especially when I don't want to play with solver or solvers too small. The um, uh, professional version of solver, of course, which costs thousands of dollars per seat, oh my, is much better and very interesting to use as well. So that's the setup. And here's the result. 194 units of fruit pie all at once and 133 savories. Now we might round this, uh, I might round this 133 up to a gross, 144. And I might take this, I don't know, I might bring it down, I don't know. Uh, I might increase my costs a little bit, but there's, I, I have to figure out if I put a handling in here. <laughs> but here are, here are the formulas, very straightforward. Using, of course, formula text. And um, if I look at the two of them together, oh, this is a lousy drawing. I am sorry. Uh, one of these is fruit. The other is savory pies. I could look at this grid, as I mentioned before, of costs. And in the middle here, right about here, right about where my cursor is, and I could put a little marker there. I had a marker there, but it got washed out. Um, I could draw a marker there and just as easily come up with the same solution. That's a brute force approach. The ochre blob, as you can see, is lower and the 264 is even lower and uh, the green blob is higher cost. Okay. And these... Yeah, there, there, there are only minor differences there in cost. That's a real zoom in. And now, now we, now we put some more practicality into it. We put in two um, life constraints. One is the fact that we don't have an infinite amount of space, cubic feet of uh, of um, refrigeration or uh, near near frozen condition. We want to preserve our pies. These pies are interesting. They have no preservatives in it. How, how do you do that? Like well, freeze. Uh, the uh, uh, Ezekiel bread, which is a sprouted bread, has zero and it's sold in many and uh, very profitably sold in many, many stores has no preservatives in it. And very little salt too, by the way. 
And then we have an investment constraint. We only want to spend so much money on this stuff. We want to reduce our investment. Somebody also needs to go back and figure out the return on this investment. That's a different problem and an interesting one for anybody who would like to propose that for their final project. Yes, fascinating. So we have uh, um, uh, HVAC engineering up here. We have financial engineering down here, all in the same model. Imagine that. So we set this one up by having the co the constraint constants here it's uh, uh the purchase is how we get how much are we how much, how much are we spending on q and we're going to use variable cost of production for that 200 two dollars and 98 cents here and b2 will be two dollars and 95 cents here less than or equal to we have a budget that's a less than or equal to term if it's greater than or equal to that's a requirement at least as much, but that's not what we're doing here. Less than or equal to, write this one down, is a budget, a not to exceed amount. All right, so we have that. We can write contracts off of this probably. Nothing inter interpersonal. <laughs> there's nothing happening. Uh, well, there's a little bit of a trade-off here. The trade-off is actually built into the holding costs not the replenishment so much. Yeah, yeah, replenishment by way of a trade-off with demand. Anytime you see these constants getting getting um, different, there's a trade-off occurring. Space is one-to-one. -one. They're taking up the same space. You see how we calculate it up there or down there. You'll see it. And uh, production costs, we already know how to compute that. No no allocated fixed cost here, please. This is the straight value from, from the horse's mouth of the production manager. Okay. Uh, at which point they give you title, <laughs> you, the inventory manager, they give you title. It's now your responsibility. Okay. And uh, down here, we still have the old EOQ just for comparison purposes. We have 75 cubic feet feet to the third power uh, 800 us dollars to play with and that's it that's not much want to keep this small we can increase it whoa that would be interesting look what happens to the eoq it goes from 193 down to 176 for fruit it goes from 133 down to 124 okay we're within bounds 875, we're right on and within bounds. Okay. Now, why is this one different? Okay, what what's different here? Oh, we, oh, right. Yeah, okay. What did I do first? I only had one in here and you see the result. Now, what happens if I, okay, I understand what I did. What happens if I put both of them in? Here's the result. I, I should have put another uh, page in here. Uh, with just one, like a space constraint, you already see this going down. And that's what that says up here, just one of the constraints. If you put both constraints, you see it go down even further. Okay, investment does constrain things in the world. And you notice that you have 75, but only use 67. That's because of the hard constraint on this purchase. Now it's interesting, um, hard constraints become goals. And uh, at the end of this course, we're gonna consider a goal programming decision model, which to me is the epitome of these decision models. They're the epitome because they force you to think about uh, prioritizing two possibly competing goals, like cost and environmental protection for the city of Montreal. Every time they remove snow, they create an environmental problem. Why? Snow contains contaminants. Huh. And it costs money to move snow. 
tons and tons of snow a year. They have a trade-off. They have a prioritization. What do they do? Talk to talk to uh, uh, Madame La Mer of uh, Montreal. Okay, now this is where I introduce the notion of a Lagrange multiplier. A small increase, a one dollar increase in the investment to eight hundred and one dollars of investment will decrease costs by. 6.34 cents, 634 basis points. Okay. We're talking finance. That's interesting. That's called the shadow price. It's the value of the investment. The value of the investment is also known as what? Oh, my gosh. You can translate it into a rate of return or an interest rate. This is where interest rates come from, from the point of view of optimization models. And um, I go through the little laborious trick here of uh, deriving two equations, one in the shadow price lambda, um, the other in, in, in Q. And here is our investment minus, and I'm doing it just for one of the two, one of the two, I'm probably doing it for fruit here. And I'm using Al Quarizmi's approach, who also did a minimization and a maximization, the largest square. Um, everybody's doing this, been doing it for a long time with whatever tools we have. Our tools now will improve. Uh, and uh, if I take the marginal cost with respect to quantity and the marginal cost with respect to that value of investment, that's that lambda, that's literally a per unit, per dollar value of investment, I come up with these two equations. Now, this lambda I minus, this is a correction to the cost. It's a correction. Lambda will be negative. It will lower the cost for just adding a little bit more I, just a little bit more, at a BQ rate. Okay, B is variable cost of production. Remember, boy, production gets in here. And I can do the uh, the algebra. Somebody please check my algebra. I'm pretty sure this bottom one is correct. Top one looks a little bit odd, but it, it's got some of the same characteristics. It's got an H down here. I don't know, I don't like the B minus H. I squared I like down here. It's got a K and a D up here. I like that. The rest of this looks awfully complicated. It works, but check it out. Yeah, you can get that. I don't do any more than that. I just want you to understand what is going on with that lambda. If we don't it it causes a very interesting problem. Okay. So um I go through and talk a little bit about how Q and Lambda depend upon B and H in this situation. I did this only because I want to show you it gets complicated. Uh, numerically, we can change these things, these amounts, okay? Uh, what we have to do is figure out numerically what all of the interactions, and that's why we do sensitivity analysis. That's what this is, a sensitivity analysis. Okay, back to the future. And we're gonna finish with this. I always reuse good templates. This was a good template. Uh, I used it for a six period production problem. Wanted to get a pretty quick idea about production uh, given an inventory constraint and a demand constraint for all that matters, because that's buried inside of the inventory. Look at the equation, beginning plus production minus dem for demand. Gosh, I could have spared it. Minimum and maximum production, average inventory, and a fairly small uh, holding cost per unit. I calculate the inventory and production costs gives me a total cost. 
I also have a safety stock level and a warehouse capacity level in this model. A lot of cool stuff. And I can arrange it this way or this way, depending upon how the client wants to see it. They're both equivalent, both equivalent. And you can check this out as well. Um, I also had a drawing which will improve on for XYZ organization, a multi-period production plan. This is called a network uh, drawing and I describe it in some detail here below. And I just wanna introduce you to the fact that we're using six nodes and things are coming in, two things coming in and two things going out. When we produce what's coming in, is, is coming into uh, period one is inventory. This is the original beginning inventory. What's coming out is inventory on hand between period one and period two. Also, what's coming out is demand. And people use graphical models like this and then algebraicize them, they make them into algebra. That works really fine. So we tighten this up with some more algebra. You can read through this. I'm not going to. Uh, belabor the point we we can generalize this model that's what this is doing i can generalize this model and i'm looking for the generalities i'm looking for a way to do that one of the generalities i'm going to be very interested in as we move forward is the fact that um, demand uh, and production can be variable they can be random. They can have a, a variability associated with a mean and a standard deviation, for example. They can have a, an, a location and a scale. Okay, location is usually that. And then Harris pops back up. But we're back to decisions, criteria, and constraints. I am laying out our model in algebraic terms. Please look at it. It's a very useful, concise way. And there's logic inside of this. That's the point. There's logic inside of this. Uh, there's a whole family of optimization techniques that takes into account um, these inequality constraints, and that's called Kuhn Tucker Karush, um, KKT optimization. Way beyond the scope of this course, but way useful, especially for the toy models we're dealing with. This is a toy model because it's very low dimension but gets the basic ideas out that we're looking for. So I include that. And then I lickety split go and say, okay, we talk to the client, they give us some data, here's the data. They have forecasted demand. Where do these forecasts come from? Out of somebody's hat, probably. We have a beginning inventory, that's out of the books. Minimum and maximum production, it's what the uh, production people think they can get away with, okay? Anything below this, anything above this, the machines wear out, the people wear out, the facility blows up, something happens that's not good. They like to keep it within these contexts. And cost per unit, that's the very very production cost per unit that we uh, saw before. And holding cost per unit is enormous, by the way. But we're dealing with food, we're dealing with perishables with no preservative and people are willing to pay $9 a pie, pretty good. And so we go back to the client and we draw this up on the board and make it look pretty. Uh, this is actually done in Excel too, um, where you can use super and subscripts, you can, you can do all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, uh, but it's all here. Oh, got to fix this. This is not per, this is not camera ready yet. I got to make these things the same size. Yeah, I hate doing that. I hate doing that because it's a lot of time um, uh, sitting with a, a dialogue boxes, nested dialogue boxes that have a, a gazillion, which is my word of the week for a lot of different choices. And you play with it back and forth to see what works. Uh, we then set up our own model. Okay. Check this model out. And it's all in here. And, and the yellow line that I can barely see, hopefully you can, uh, is the decision line. And the, and the real only big constraint, there's actually two of these, 
um, we have to have enough inventory. If we add this up over the period, um, and we're not adding it up, we're saying each and every period has to be greater than or equal to a minimum amount. That's a safety stock. That's a requirement. A not, and at least then. And then we have a not to exceed. We have more. Wait, you're going to find we're going to have we have more warehouse space. I don't, I hope we're, hopefully we're not paying for it, but I bet we are. And if we are, we might want to figure out how to use that space differently. Oh, give it over to the production people, maybe. I don't know if the in inventory manager wants to do that, but uh, incentivized by uh, minimizing costs, they might need to do that. And again, all the formulae are here. Here's the setup with the two uh, production minimum, uh, maximum, minimum production screen. Yes, that's maximum first, minimum second. And then the safety stock and warehouse constraints are here. This is a simplex problem because it's all linear. Whole world's linear in this particular case. Uh, we're solving uh, simultaneous underdetermined equations, lovely, oh my. Uh, and uh, this was a late request that we popped in here. Yes, uh, safety stock. Now in the final model, Uh, we get these results. Production, demand, and the final numbers. So there are many next steps. Please go over them. And I think that will be it for what we're going to try to do today. Take care. And again, thank you very much for your kind attention.